You may remember the name Tony Kukoc from The Last Dance as the international sensation that got put in handcuffs by his future teammates during the 1992 Olympics. The five-time European Player of the Year that never seemed to be able to reach the same heights in the NBA. The defensive liability that rode Jordan, Pippen, and Dennis Rodman's coattails to three titles. But what if that's not really who Kukoc was? What if he was an incredible offensive player that was misunderstood because he played the game in a way we'd never seen before? What if he wasn't a complete negative on the defensive side of the ball? And what if he actually should have been a multi-time all-star in the late 90s? Tony Kukoc was one of the very first prototypes to the point forward model. He was listed at 6'10", but could handle the ball like a 6'1 guard. In fact, his blend of size and skill was so mesmerizing that the great Dirk Nowitzki even modeled his game after him. He could drive the ball and finish with either hand, although he was highly preferential to his left. But back then, fewer players were ambidextrous, so this limitation in his finishing arsenal didn't actually affect his scoring efficiency too much relative to the time. From 1994 to 1998, he was always at or above the league average in true shooting. His ability to put the ball on the deck and attack was impactful for multiple reasons. First, he was incredibly agile for his frame. So agile that most of the players his size couldn't keep him in front of them. This made him a matchup nightmare for opposing defenses. Earlier in his career, Kukoc lacked a reactive handle. If you stonewalled his initial drive, he was immediately flustered and didn't know how to counter. This became a problem on the rare occasion there was someone who could match his size and speed out on the perimeter. Take for instance this clip from this 1994 game against the Knicks. The secretly mobile Anthony Mason sealed off his initial move and poor Tony didn't know what to do. As time went on, Kukoc developed counters to these situations. Seven months after the previous clip, Kukoc got another shot at New York on Christmas Day. Again, the defender stymied his drive left, but this time Kukoc raises his stone wall with a spin right and floater. He misses, but we're more concerned with the process than the results. Along with being a walking mismatch, Kukoc was also a black belt in collapsing the defense. When Kukoc would drive, he'd often warrant the help of additional defenders, which created open layups and perimeter shots for his teammates. That brings us to Kukoc's greatest skill as a player, his passing. He occasionally missed the all-time level reads that the Magic Johnsons of the world would hit, but other than that, he could make any pass in the book. While operating out of a live dribble, he could spray kickout passes to open shooters, or he could fit interior passes into tight windows. Remember, 90 spacing really sucked. In the post, when he would face a double team, he could immediately read where the help was coming from and make the right decision from there. In a 1998 game against the Hornets, Kukoc got the ball on the block against the 6-foot David Wesley. To avoid conceding an easy shot, Charlotte decided to get clever with their double team by sending Glenn Rice over to help from the weak side. But their creativity was for nothing, as Kukoc immediately realized that Ron Harper was now open and proceeded to fling the ball over to him for an easy look. Speaking of post-ups, Kukoc's height granted him access to a vantage point few perimeter players had ever seen. That view made him an amazing entry passer, which was a valuable asset to the post-centric game that was played in the 90s. Regardless of what type of pass he was making, Kukoc delivered nearly all of them with pinpoint speed and accuracy. This lob pass he tossed to MJ during his final game as a bull merits a gold star. In transition, he glided gracefully down the court like a gazelle, able to initiate the break like a Midwest magic. And he was also a great outlet passer. Back to that Christmas Day game, notice how quickly he is able to launch this full court pass to a streaking Scottie Pippen. Do you see how swiftly he's able to map out the floor in his mind? That brings us to another one of the hallmark features of his game, the speed of his decision making. Along with being one of the first bigs with ball handling skills, he was also one of the first true read and react players. 
when he got the ball, he immediately knew where the defense was most vulnerable, and if he couldn't find any openings, he wouldn't waste any time dribbling the air out of the ball. Instead, he'd give the Spalding up and try to make something happen off ball. This clip from a 1996 game against the Miami Heat illustrates his decisiveness perfectly. After securing the rebound, he wastes no time sprinting up the court and looking to attack in early offense. He quickly identifies that the defense has done a nice job of getting back in transition, so he swings the ball over to Pippen and relocates on the perimeter. Pippen can't create an advantage, and the ball comes back to Kukoc, who then tries to drive the closeout. No dice again, so Kukoc gives the ball back to Pippen, he then eventually comes off the screen for a jumper. But then he sees that his man is all up in his grill, and that a streaking cutter is available, so he opts for the good old Kobe Bryant shot pass. We have another miss here, but again the point is the process. All of his decisions are being made instantaneously and based off of what the defense is giving him. Kukoc played basketball with a great deal of conviction. His game had very little fat. He hardly ever wasted a movement. This made him a very talented off-ball player. He could hit connective dimes in his sleep, and he executed give-and-go cuts so effectively that you had to rewind your TV to make sure that Larry Bird hadn't come out of retirement and been playing for the Bulls. His ability to pass, cut, and move made him a perfect fit for Chicago's offense. He knew how to fulfill the duties of all three parts of Tex Winner's famous triangle offense, even the piece that required you to come off a screen and pop it from outside. That was the other thing about Kukoc. He was a 6'10 dude who could shoot. In the 1998 season, Kukoc was in the 45th percentile league-wide in accuracy from three, and in the 68th percentile in volume. Those are more than respectable numbers for a man of his stature during that time, and it enabled the Bulls to have extra length on the floor without sacrificing spacing, which then helped elevate them on the other side of the ball. For a more detailed analysis on how Kukoc fit with Chicago on defense, here's a great friend of mine, Matt Issa. Watch any Bulls game from the second half of the 1990s, and you are almost guaranteed to catch a remark from a broadcaster about Kukoc's poor defense. And it is true, he certainly had his limitations on that end of the court. While his motions on offense were purposeful and effective, his defensive movements were awkward and laborious. He was frequently blown by at the point of attack, which wasn't as big of a deal as it would be today because there were so many more bodies to back him up and paint. You can thank the poor spacing of the 1990s for that, but did make him a moving target when he was out on the perimeter. He also struggled to navigate screens and in the post, while he tried his very best to hold his ground, he often got bullied by the bigger brutes of his era. There were also some concerns with his motor. He may have been a non-stop mover on offense, but on defense he was hardly as frenetic. A great indicator of motor is how well or often someone boxes out for rebounds, and that simply wasn't a big part of Kukoc's repertoire. Despite all of his deficiencies though, Kukoc was always a solid positive with the Bulls in defensive metrics like defensive box plus minus, and that's because he was actually pretty good at playing his role on that end of the court. Like we alluded to earlier, his length was a massive asset to him in the Bulls' defense. During that time, tactics for double teaming in the post were the modern day equivalent of pick and roll coverages, and although he couldn't defend on an island down there, he was damn good at swooping in as a second defender and disrupting the sequence. Here, the Jazz use a cross screen action to set up a post up for Antoine Carr. Carr receives the entry pass and goes to work until Kukoc comes to double and let's just say Carr passing out of a double team doesn't look nearly as fluid as Kukoc doing it. Kukoc was so good at being the second defender on double teams that he was the Bulls go-to guy in this area when he was on the floor. Like we said, having someone like Kukoc as your designated double team guy was incredibly valuable back then because a large part of how good you were on defense was predicated upon how good you were at defending the post. And the Bulls were a very, very good defense, ranking in the top six in defensive rating every year Kukoc was there, except for that depressing season after Michael Jordan left, but you get the point. 
His length also helped him in the passing lanes. He may have not been able to mix it up against stronger guys in isolation, but he could deny them the ball completely by using his pterodactyl wingspan to blow up entry passes without even having to front in the post. He wasn't that much of a vertical presence and his rim protection numbers were unimpressive because of that. But because he was so gifted as a perimeter shooter, the Bulls could field two good rim protectors next to him whenever he was on the floor. And thanks to his length, he was an overall plus for the team in this category when he was acting as their third option. Speaking of third options, could Kukoc have been more than that on offense? What I'm saying is, was his impact on that end hindered by playing behind MJ and Pippen? Or was he actually in the perfect role for his set of skills? To find out, let's send it back to Hoop Venue. Scottie Pippen infamously missed 37 games during the 1998 season. Yet, despite going from the third offensive option to being Jordan's second in command, Kukoc's scoring and playmaking volume remained practically unchanged, while his efficiency slightly decreased. This is admittedly a pretty small sample, but it suggests that Kukoc wasn't built to be a high-level offensive number one or number two. With that said, he was a championship-level offensive number three, one who was able to blend his on- and off-ball abilities to fit seamlessly alongside arguably the greatest duo in NBA history. And as we've outlined here, he wasn't nearly the sieve that people made him out to be on defense. In fact, thanks to his size, he was pretty close to average on that end for his era. On top of that, his progressive offensive toolkit enabled the Bulls to put more defense around him without sacrificing offense. All this is to say that while he never earned an official nomination during his playing days, Tony Kukoc performed at an all-star level for the Chicago Bulls during their dynasty. I want to give a huge shout out to Matt Issa for contributing in a major way to the making of this video. This was a collaboration that we spent multiple weeks working on, crunching all the film and numbers that we could find to shed some light on an incredibly unique player. Matt actually wrote out the script for this one, and that's kind of his thing in the NBA sphere, so if you enjoyed this video, you'll love some of his other content, which I'll provide links to in the description. Also make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on my future videos. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.